All right, good to see all of you. We're in Galatians, obviously. I was hoping to speak on Galatians 1, 4, so I'll lead out with that, and I'll return to a quote last week that was made. Uh, I received it from Dr. James Candler's blog post. He labors and writes and then provides quotes that uh, have really been encouraging to me. This one I said last week, it said, it's impossible to enslave mentally or socially a Bible-reading people. And, you know, I know it's ironic that I would say this because it was actually people that call themselves believing people, I suppose, whatever they call themselves, who would tell me it's just hard to pin you down. And one man said, you have to fall, descend into one camp or another. I said, well, you're correct about that. He said, really? I said, well, the fall part. I would have to descend to that level. Now, he even acknowledged it. If we can't put you in a camp... Then, and what that's called in the world where we actually study is objectify someone. You know, you can't just be an American citizen and participate in the electoral process. We have to say, but are you a Republican or a Democrat? And then once we objectify you accordingly, we can say, ah, but are you a Trump or Biden supporter? And now we can subjectify you, even have penalties and threats on global television networks saying that if you voted for a particular candidate, people are recommending you be put on a Homeland Security watch list. Isn't that great? How mentally inept and how much uh, devoid of character people can become when you permit them and turn your lives over, as people do so often in this country, turn their lives over to those who have called and taken the position. We're here to objectify you. I remember the first time a man said, I'm a pre-tribber, and I'd never heard of it. What do you mean you never heard of it? I said, I've never heard of an identity that way. I thought he said he was a Baptist. I said, well, yeah, he's a Baptist, but he's a Baptist pre-tribber Baptist. Okay, that makes sense. So what does that mean? Well, then the person saying it couldn't repeat any more than the title of the position according to which the man had now identified himself. So if you think we can become so far removed from any content or meaning... Ask people what the words mean that they're saying. If they have some idea, then it's meaningful, full of meaning. If they don't, it's meaningless. It just becomes jargon. And you say, well, what's the problem with that? Well, again, I, I don't know what you mean today if you say you're a Democrat or Republican because I want our old candidates back. I would like to go back to when I knew what that meant. And I would like to go back when it held implication. Now everybody seems to have moved all the positions right and left and a man told me he was a Republican, and after he talked, I said, well, if that's a Republican, I can't join you. He said, what do you mean? He said, we have social positions that don't contradict our fiscal positions. And I'm like, I try to support the values that are the very infrastructure of the future of this nation and upon which this country depends. So when I read and see something like this, it says impossible to enslave mentally or socially a Bible-reading people, I now understand, oh, why they can't enslave me mentally, can't put me in their boxes because I have more words than the name on their box. Amen? I mean, just a cursory reading of the Bible would cause all of us to see the silliness of the feigned categories that people are propping up and using to be disappointed. Have you noticed how many people are longing to be disappointed in you? When I remember as a child, we were taught to give our talents to the Lord. People would pray and say, well, maybe someday the Lord will call you to preach. Or maybe someday our church will grow and we will build and we'll reach other people. Y'all remember that? Until I woke up in a day where people were saying, how dare you want to grow and build and reach people? How dare you think that you as a pastor are fulfilling what people prayed for. How do you think, do you not understand how fragile we are and how sensitized we are to anything that might show some indication of an inbreaking of the kingdom of God, <laughs> a relevance of Jesus Christ. What a turn, 180 degree turn, 180 degree turn. Well, it's because there's not a lot of Bible reading going on. The principles of the Bible are the groundwork of human freedom. That was Horace Greeley, American abolitionist. And then the next quote I'd taken and received graciously from him. He said, I have a fundamental belief in the Bible as the Word of God written by men who were inspired. I study the Bible daily. Anybody know what great famous scientist said then? Sir Isaac Newton, he developed calculus. Do you hear that? He developed calculus. Someone said, well, didn't he also advocate alchemy? I'm like, he was probably smart enough to figure that out too. So 
I'm not sure I understand what the point was when someone said that. So how is this man who developed calculus and such an astute person in a mind like that a theologian? Remember I tell you with you once someone didn't understand the rationale for me being in a calculus class and the teacher stopped the class and said, he's the one most logically here. What do you mean? Well, this subject was developed by a theologist. He said the word theologist. I'd never heard that before. Always theologian. But isn't it remarkable that that which allows everything we know today, even these things called cell phones and all this technology, was developed by theologians, theologists. And today, if you were to be studying at all, you'd almost see people give the impression uh, of disdain toward people who serve God with our minds. Almost. I mean, I've had people almost imply that if you have taken this too seriously, it might go outside the norm and make too many people obvious that they're disengaged. But that, who would live their life with that intention? I've never heard of that. That's what's going on in Galatians, this letter to the Galatian churches. There's pressure. Remember, they added one law, circumcision. You know what happened soon after? Well, you already know. Well, wait a minute. Now there's a group that added circumcision, but now this group added circumcision plus special days that were mentioned in the Old Testament. Well, now wait a minute. So that's the gospel of justification by faith alone, out from the faithfulness of Jesus Christ only, plus circumcision, which negates everything about Christ's faithfulness, and now special days. Well, what are we now? Well, see, and it just goes on and on, and look where we are today. The first thing people will tell you about that church, or this church, I, I went to that church before it was called that church. Y'all know that? Amen? Yeah. We've got uh, this church, that church, whatever. And I was really amazed because uh, you hear about cause and effect a lot. And people say, well, we need to do root cause analysis to see what brought about this effect. Well, today we're going to talk about the cross and effect. Cross and effect. And the first effect of the, of the cross, the first effect of the cross for these churches was the Bible says they were running well. I mean, they had come out. They had, these primarily Gentile people had come out and been baptized and had covenanted together and were now ecclesias, plural, in that southern region of Galatia and were living their lives under the glory of God and for the good of one another and especially good for the community. So good and so well were they running that I can refer back to a time in this community when everything on the Lord's Day stopped. Everything on the Lord's Day stopped. And then when the Lord's people stopped, all that started again. Do you hear that? Yeah, because after all, we ran well. Who hindered you? And all it took was someone to say, hey, wait a minute. If we just had one thing, then we're accepted by all things. It's over. We don't have to bear this reproach of Christ. Really think about that. The offense of the cross is something we would like to idle down. That's exactly what was taking place. That was the strategy. If you think about it, especially in our community, what pressure do we have except social? It's just social. And since I've never had a social life, all I've ever had is my eternal life. That's great, isn't it? I mean, what a relief for someone who only gives his life to the service of that which achieved the interest of Christ, which to assure that his Father receives the glory, and that by Christ he is, and that in the ecclesia. And we love our neighbor. Well, that's how we show our love for God, is by loving our neighbor. We go and assure that people are engaged graciously, that we explain what a text says, these liberating, glorious truths. So here we have this, and I mentioned the conclusions from last week. Three factions were engaged. Now, they weren't making disciples. You all do know that. Remember, Jesus said, keep your hand to the plow. And he said, occupy till I come, not preoccupy. I was consulting two clients last week, and I was explaining to them they're young people. I said, well, you remember recently during the COVID thing, people were saying mask on. No, no, mask off, mask on. Which one was it? They said, yeah, what about it? I said, well, what were you doing? Did you think that our, our, our world would come to where that was enough with which we could preoccupy ourselves? And the people who later said mask off were the ones who were saying mask on. So they said, what are you getting at? I said, well, I'm going to teach you to occupy during those times. And I told them what my sons had done and how I'd led them in the accomplishments they made during that 
what was it? Mask? No, off, mask on. Remember? You say, well, which one is it? Well, that wasn't what the point was. The point was people were preoccupied now. And it was enough. Think about it. It's enough that it even made headlines and media outlets could pay their bills. And corporate sponsors would pay them to keep that going. You remember, I asked my clients last week, youngsters, they don't have a clue. I said, are you for the $15 an hour or against it? Well, what should I be? I said, well, who, where'd you get the 15 You remember in the 70s, I showed the YouTube video commercial, Fram Oil Filter, from the 70s that I watched as a child in one of the Lord's churches in the south end of this community. And the pastor used that illustration because there was a mechanic wiping all this grease off. And he's saying, you can pay me now or you can pay me later, saying that if you put off this Fram oil filter, buying it and getting that oil change, that new well-designed technology, uh, whatever you call it, Fram oil filter, you'll have serious motor problems, so you can pay me now or pay me later. And what did my pastor say when I was just a, maybe 10 or something? Well, you don't have to buy a Fram oil filter. Ah, what wisdom, what brilliance. You don't have to pick $15 an hour or be against $15 an hour. You might even acquire a marketable skill that could generate a return on your investment of time, talent, and energy that would be more than that. Oh, I never thought about that. So you see why I enjoy consulting young people and giving them systems with exponential returns so that the futility of life is unknown to them. Did you hear what I just said? The futility of life is unknown to them because they're being taught how to assure a return on the investment to be a good steward of their time, of their talents, because I explain very unashamedly, all this was given to you by God. I've told people before, I don't have time for whatever you're doing because they're just preoccupied. And do you want me to bring them up sometime on the slides and give you their names and show you their resume? We can use one, well, matter of fact, we can use a piece of a slide. And, but I can tell you with what they were so preoccupied and how anxious they were to engage other people in that which was much less than that for which Christ himself laid down his life. So Christ didn't die for me to go sit on a Coke box at Wally's gas station with Goober on the right and Gomer on the left, did he? Well, no, Brother Carter, no. Well, then why do people pretend that they admire Goober and Gomer? Maybe they don't see the good in the discipline by design and the rigors of study and what it can do to us in transforming our lives by the renovation of our minds, as the church letter to Rome said. You know, God knows best. So here are these people. They're not doing what first happened. And let, let me get to that. Uh, first of all, John 12, 31 through 33 says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Now, first of all, I'm just mentioning uh, this death of Christ because Paul had said that this one who gave us Verse 4, chapter 1, Galatians, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God our Father. Now we know ultimately we will spend eternity with him. We know that when the, he returns bodily and sits on the throne of David, we will reign with him for a thousand years on this regenerated earth. And then at the end of that, when all the judgments are concluded at the end, the new heaven, new earth, and here we'll continue to live out our lives as we're doing today. So what are we to be doing now? What was the significance of the death of Christ today? Well, it has implications for here and now, amen? I mean, what drives a father to raise his children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord if the Lord in whose admonition and nurture we're raising them is not the one who laid down his life for them? And if the one who laid down his life for them is not the one who created them, what are we doing associating our children with him? And if he is what the Bible says he is and the God that is his father is whom Jesus revealed him to be, why would we not want our children to listen to everything he has to say? I mean, I've been ridiculed by some of the uh, lewdest and basest people for listening to my father. And was it that gracious of God to reach me by using the most influential man in my life, my father, to persuade me to Christ? Wasn't that just... I mean, in some ways, you, you know, it's like Einstein said, God's very clever. But the Bible says better. He's very gracious. 
It's His benevolence that leads a man to mind and association with Him and trust His Son for, Jesus, for everlasting life. Do you see that? Well, how could I not be at church sitting beside my father? You know, if some of us who've been through a little bit, we'd look back and we'd love to go back and sit there again. As I'd love to sit there and have that green sock on and that brown sock on and raise up that pants leg and cause one of my brothers to laugh so my dad could... Oh, man, I could slap my brother without even moving. Because you know what they would do? I told you, they would giggle. Wouldn't you love to go back? Yeah, you say, what are you talking about? Well, we, you remember when everything in the world stopped except the churches. Now the churches stopped and then blame the world who continues to go on. You say, what are you talking about? Well, science says some hap something happened in 1950. And after that, I guess, I guess the economy improved. And I've noticed men who are so anxious to gather the stuff that, what did I do with my family? Where's my children? Oh, oh, I don't know. But if you're reaching for a brass ring that requires you to give them up, don't reach for it. It's, it's not brass. Galatians 5, 7, you did run well who did hinder you. That you should not obey the, obey the truth. Now, obey means that you would not be persuaded by the truth. Now, back to what I just read, Jesus said, I will, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. Let, what's the first effect of that? What's the first thing Jesus mentioned as the implication of him being lifted up on that cross and hang there, which the book of Galatians tells us, the Bible says, cursed is every man that is hanged on a tree. And it was proof that if we can get Jesus to that tree, we can prove that the law rightly judged him and weren't we right to reject him since he's now cursed according to the very law that Jesus said he didn't come to abolish but rather to fulfill and he did fulfill it by becoming the very object on which all the wrath and judgment for all the penalties accrued because of that law all landed on Jesus. But what was the first implication? I will draw all men. I missed a lot of classes growing up and you all know about it. And I would walk into a class and someone was already talking. I walked into a class once. You know what they were talking about? Does all mean all, all the time? That would be the second effect. Because I said, wait a minute, did I miss a class? There was a scholar who wrote an article that all never means all and you can be assured that that's true all the time. Another person said all always means all, so just leave it that way. Again, I missed class. But I was in a coursework later in learning that in educational processes, if you leave out a core feature, it's very difficult for the student to ever acquire subject matter expertise and any applicable uh, or application of that knowledge, practical application. So I thought, well, I missed class. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you all are bantering over does all mean all? And you just said it means all all the time. And the other person said it doesn't mean all and probably doesn't mean all all the time. I said, was that the effect of Jesus being lifted up? I mean, I, I'm just trying to get caught up with the class. So where, where, where did y'all meet about what it was to be drawn by him? I, oh, oh, so we never had that class. No, no, we were so anxious to get there. Uh, we had uh, Charlie over here and uh, Bubba over here. And Bubba was saying all don't mean all. And uh, Charlie was saying all means all. And I, so we never had the class about being drawn by Christ's crucifixion. We haven't had the class where we were anxious to gather to speak of what it was like to be so persuaded that we find ourselves today willing to lay down our lives for each other in service to this one called Christ. I told you I missed a lot of classes. I would miss things that then we would be somewhere two or three steps into a conversation. Like I said, I was in a class and we were, uh, I was actually teaching the class, Matthew 24. And someone said, where's the rapture? I said, well, I'm going through. I've, I've taken every word and, and even looked it up myself. And so I thought they were about to help me because I couldn't find it in Matthew 24. <laughs> but I wasn't looking for it. I was just trying to keep my eyes on these words as I was going through it. Do you know they, they didn't want to show me where it was? So I asked a question. I said, may I ask a question? Did I miss a class somewhere? They said, what do you mean? I said, well, if we are talking about the return of Christ, 
where was the class where we spoke of our devotion, dedication, and faithfulness to be keeping the word of His patience. And by doing so, He Himself personally said to His church, because you kept the word of my patience, I will keep you out from the great trial that's about to come to be upon the earth. And I don't really, I'm not ready to go to the class that's asking, was that the great trial in the past or the great trial in the future or the great trials throughout history? I'm still asking, where's the class that says, there's the focus, there's the occupation with which we should be occupied until he comes, the word of his patience, that one who was obedient unto death, a kind of death, the Bible literally says, the death of a cross. I keep missing the class. So you see what happened in Galatia was they had made it to that class. Somewhere they had attended the class because it says you did run well. It says, who did hinder you that you should not obey? That is, be persuaded by the truth. Now we know Jesus is the truth personified. He said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. We know when people in Jesus' time, when He was walking on the earth, we're arguing about the resurrection. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and I'm the life. Now, wait a minute. That would then have an effect. This cross had an effect. So at one point, these people knew what it was to run well. They knew what it was to be persuaded by the truth. And the Bible says that there is a judgment coming for the household of God. And since that is the case, what will the end be of those who have negated persuasion by the gospel of the God that is the Father of Jesus Christ. Now what will that be like? So they made it to class. They were there when the effect was first on the teacher's curriculum list. Lesson plan one, lesson one, object lesson, application. They were not only persuaded, but they were now covenant together as an ecclesia under this new covenant, living it out in a way of worship that was in uh, spirit and in truth and was acceptable to God and liberating for them. You remember the gospel is an emancipating message. Have you ever noticed how frustrating people are who say, you must fall into one camp or another, sir. You don't want to be in a car with them. And what if they don't like the voice on the GPS? They might say, look, you have to be, I, I don't even know what they do. Whatever the weirdness is, it, it, it's hardly unique in the Lord's churches. This is pressure from people saying, you need to fall into our camp because whatever you all are doing is outside of our camp. As a matter of fact, there's even a text that said, let us go outside the camp and suffer reproach with Christ. And yet people will say, in frustration, exactly. now think about this, if you're at home today and one of your children's there by the grace of God and they're healthy and they're, uh, they're beloved, they obey you, they respond to you. Now, I don't mean you don't have to tug a little bit. I don't mean you don't have to sometimes pat them along. Pat them along a little bit. Amen? But there they are with you. And you hear your children talking about some of these things. What would be your first concern? Especially when they say, you know, I think I'm just going to disengage from school. Why? What's, what happened? Well, I didn't like how long the sermon was. Oh, son, listen. I don't know how you drew a line between those two things, but that seems to be some type of neurosis. And I'm concerned about your life, and I want you to be occupied with homework, discipline, obedient to your parents, and to be subject to the admonition and nurture of the Lord that we afford you so graciously as parents who have given up our lives for you. So I really, I'll be honest, I never experienced in all these years. Today's my son's birthday, 38 years old. I've never known him and his brother to be outside and hear the car tires spinning. And I say, what happened? Why did Blake leave out of here like that? So angry. He's a mid-tribber, daddy. I said, what do you mean, son? Well, I don't put up with mid-tribbers. I say, son, that's your first effect at the idea of the return of Christ is to get into it with your brother and not to live your life in such a manner as to bring God the glory, and that would be by Christ Jesus, and that's in the ecclesia, that you wouldn't bring God glory by being a father to your children, a husband to your wife, a brother in the covenant, especially a brother to your own brother. Well, Dad, you don't understand. He had a red push pin, I had a green one, he put his red one in the wrong spot. That's a chart. You say there's no way in God's universe that people ever come to the point where they'll be so preoccupied. Oh, yes, Absolutely. And it's because we are trained to not take pressure. Amen. 
we won't do it. We are told it's a virtue to be fragile. We're told it's a virtue to be pliant. And yet, we learned a lesson about Balaam that it was a lesson that condemned being pliant. You remember one moment Balaam being told by the Lord to do something and he runs to do it. Next thing he's being told what to do by a king on this earth and he runs to go do it. People say, well, what's the problem? That was the problem. God was teaching us the lesson of what? Don't be pliant. You remember he said John the Baptist, remarkable man, wasn't he? He, was, he, was, he, was, he wasn't a reed shaken by the wind. You remember when John was occupied with what God had given him to do, John was doing great. And then later when John's arrested because he was off doing a, uh, what we call it, another job and being preoccupied with an unlawful marriage, he wound up incarcerated in prison. And what was the first thing he did? Well, Jesus must not be the Messiah. I'm going to send word to him and say, are you the Messiah or should we wait for another one to come? And Jesus spoke of people being offended like that. Now, how would you draw a line between being preoccupied with the unlawful marriage of Herod to, or whatever that was. I don't remember her name. Anyway, and he was preoccupied with that, and then when he was incarcerated as a consequence of it, because you remember, she was tired of hearing about it. And she had him, you remember, where he, the king had sworn an oath that he would give whatever was requested. Well, they said the head of John the Baptist. And what was the first thing we saw a man like John the Baptist do? Well, it must be something wrong with my Messiah. No, it would probably be something wrong with what you gave your life to occupy with because the moment you baptized Jesus and He come up out of the water, not only would you have said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, but you would get your baptismal towel, throw it over your shoulder, and go with Jesus as well. You remember we learned later that there were students of John who had now conjoined themselves with students of the Pharisees and they had agreed, We'll both go together and confront Jesus. Did you, did you hear what I just said? Now they came out baptized by John and then later would not obey John and would not notice the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the great sin bearer. But they said we will go in league with the Pharisees and we will go collectively, Pharisee and John students, and we will confront Jesus. Isn't that striking how people will go into league and there's something that's a preoccupation with nothing that God gave us with which to be occupied? They ran well. Well, I've seen people, and oh, as long as they have an excuse, no one expects anything from them. I saw people that, as I was in a situation where someone said, don't trust that other side. And so I'm over here talking to the other side. And they said, don't trust that other side. I said, well, here's what I'll do. I won't trust either one. I'll entrust both of them. You remember, just give this one their assignment, then give this one their assignment. The ones that they said were theirs anyway. What became of that? Well, both the other side, you remember they're the problem. The other side came up with a story of why they wouldn't do their assignment. And, oh, well, you're not expected to do it if you have a story. And the other side said, well, we have a story, so we're not going to do our assignment. Now, what, what's going on today with them? I mean, when you account at the judgment seat of Christ and you're there giving an account and you're to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord, what are you saying? I'm, I'm curious, what are you saying? Well, you know, uh, we, uh, we drew a line between something that was no line to be drawn and we dissociate ourselves when that with which we were to be occupied and we preoccupied and we found ourselves around people willing to even pay for our lunch. My goodness, we, we couldn't have had it any better, Lord. Well, he said, well, I gave you a table to eat at. I gave you a fellowship to fellowship but now that one was into the gospel. And that gospel is only about Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the one who so loved us that He laid down His life for us, gave His life for us. And yet people are, will stand before Him and say, I was so preoccupied with people at their table, Lord. And I've asked this question in observing as a convert and a first generation Christian. I'm amazed. You mean there's a table better than the Lord's table? There's a fellowship better than, being into, than the one into the gospel? There's a life better outside the covenant community. Why in the world did they not tell me that while they were recruiting me into it? That's what's taking place in the southern region of Galatia. People are coming in and say, oh, did you hear about this over here? What is it? Well, no, no, it's not the Lord's table. Is it, is it the gospel? No, it's not the gospel. No, but, but come and join us. 
As a matter of fact, it's not even the correct message, but it's a, it's a gospel. But the Bible says it's not a good gospel. It's not even a gospel. It's not even a fellowship worthy of the time and life God's given us. You say, my, you seem pressed for time. Yeah, there was a time in my life, shortly after my son was born, where I was told, you more than likely won't have any more time in this life. I was like, oh my goodness, I, my work's not finished. How many of y'all still have things on your mind and heart that God gave you to accomplish in this life for His glory and for the sake of others, and you know it's still on your mind, amen? And I'm thinking, oh, all this to do, and uh, I've chilled, this, you gave me this, oh, and now I'm not even going to be here? It's easy not to listen to people who have nothing to say. Do you know what? It will become even easier when you become so occupied with what you've been so highly favored and entrusted to accomplish for the glory of God and the good of others that no one can diminish it. No one can discourage you. And I'll end on this. Because I didn't get anywhere close to what I wanted to. But I'll just tell you, I miss class about picking sides too. I mean, weren't you in class when we talked, taught Matthew 11? Because I taught it here more than once. Where Jesus says, were they like children in the marketplace? One's piping and then complaining because people aren't dancing. The other one's playing a dirge and complaining because people aren't pouting. Did, did you not make it to that class? I, I know I was there. And I thought, oh my, I, I, why are people asking me to pick sides that don't exist in the Lord's church? Why are people wanting to be just like everyone else? Well, then there's no expectations. There's nothing with which to be occupied. How would a man whose hearts turn towards children be interested in men whose hearts are? Did you hear that? And recently I get this confrontation. I couldn't reciprocate. I had neither the brain cells nor the heart to engage it. Telling me, oh, you must be so discouraged. I heard this famous global preacher recently say how preachers out there are so discouraged because people don't listen. I said, let me say this slow. If you think they're disinterested in what I say as someone who studied the Bible, put yourself in my place for a moment. What do you mean? How little interest could I possibly have in people who haven't studied it and who haven't been favored with that high calling of going into this world to be salt and light? How would I ignore what Jesus said that if you lose your salt, you're good for nothing except to be cast out as roadside gravel? How would I even be dissuaded by the silliness that people want to come and presume to impose? And you know what happened? I ended it with that confrontation by saying, you know, in 1999, a pigeon was sent to my office and landed and said, you must be awfully discouraged. And I said, I don't know how to say this to you. I said, but I'm occupied with what I've been entrusted and called to do. I said, now, if you don't want to help me, don't worry, I'll get it done. And I said, years later, I was speaking to a group, and I said, if you teach me how to succeed without you, know this, I will succeed without you. And if you think there's a scope and scale of work that people can imagine, fabricate, and place on someone in the name of we will feudalize it, you've never met anyone whose life is governed by the holy exertion I mean, the exertion of God's holy influence called the grace of God. There's nothing out there that we can't do. There's nothing out there that His grace doesn't sufficiently supply us to accomplish efficiently and effectively. Amen? Amen. So if God's uh, giving you little ones to raise, because this morning I was late. Now, do you all know I don't stay at the house? Amen? <laughs> I love the Lord. I've got to get, Pam, I've got to go. But this morning I was trying to leave and you know what came into across my path? A child who had just somehow escaped the shower and he had a towel that had a hood on it like a cape and it came down and he had something in his hand like a sock or a shirt and he was fixing his cape because he was cold and he come running by and I had to stop. I said, whoa, 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 where are you going? And I had to turn him. He said, where's PK? Where's PK? So I took him straight to PK and I said, I'm going to see Jesus. <laughs> And I left the house. But you know, there's enough grace in that house to catch that escaped from the shower 
almost naked Batman in his hooded towel. But not for me. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm not here to be... So she occupies very faithfully. Do you? And the only question is, is, is there, isn't there something in your life that you know God gave only for you to do? Children, grandchildren, spouse, husband, wife, brother, sister in the covenant. Isn't there a church somewhere where you'll occupy until He comes? Isn't there a calling somewhere in your life? Well, that's what's going on in the southern region of Galatia. But they got the first lesson. That's why he could appeal back to, I remember when you ran well. Can you remember when you ran well? And then answer the question, what hindered you? Let's pray. Father, we come to you now so grateful for this day. We thank you for life, love, kindness, mercy, and all your generosity. For the easy way that you approach us and the easy way that you sheep herd us. You do it through your son, Jesus Christ, the good shepherd. He's kind to us. He's gracious to us. He disciplines us in a way that always assures us it's for our good and for your glory. Thank you for this fellowship that you've called out here in this community. This one that's only about the grace. That grace that's personified by your son, Jesus Christ. It's only about the love. That love that's only personified by your son, Jesus Christ. And that we know only your love because your Bible says that we're knowing your love for us because Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. For all these good things for this new year that's before us and all these gracious opportunities you've given us, may we all be found occupied until your son returns so that we truly might give an account for which we'll be unashamed and hear that commendation, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand now for just a moment.